in the heart of the maelstrom that was the Battle of Berlin, emerged a division shrouded in diversity, the 11th SS Nordland, a melting pot of European resolve comprising volunteers from across the continent, Danish, Hungarian, Dutch, all the way to Spanish, and much more. Each brought their own history, language, and background to the front lines. This division, a microcosm of a continent at war, faced the onslaught of the final defense of Berlin. Their story is not one of glorification, but a testament to the harsh reality of conflict. The Battle of Berlin, a crucible where the fate of nations hung in the balance, as the city burned, the 11th SS Norland Division became a symbol of resilience, a chapter in history where soldiers, irrespective of nationality, faced the same adversary, the Soviets. Join us in exploring the raw and unheard soldiers who fought in the Battle of Berlin firsthand. Our remarkable journey commences in 1943, at the inception of the SS Freiwilligen Panzer Grenadier Division, Nordland. This formidable division, forged in March, was a fusion of dedicated volunteers hailing from Denmark, Norway, and Volksdeutsche Romanians, ethnic Germans from Romania. To further enrich its diverse composition, the ranks included a sprinkling of Swedes, Finns, and Estonians. Following rigorous training sessions conducted in Croatia, the division was thrust into the crucible of war on the Leningrad Front. Their metal was further tested as they traversed the challenging battles of Estonia and Latvia. The forces found themselves in a strategic retreat, eventually converging to create the formidable bulwark known as the Kurland Pocket in East Prussia by late 1944. It is in this crucible of adversity that the true character of the SS Freiwilligen Panzergrenadier Division Nordland was revealed, as they stood resolute in the face of overwhelming odds, forging a legacy that echoes through time. We won't dive into this battle fully, but we will tell you the basics of it so you get a better understanding. In the late months of 1944, the Nordland Division found itself engaged in intense defensive battles within the confines of the Kurland Pocket. Originally assembled at Precool with plans for a breakout to the south, the division faced formidable resistance as the Red Army detected and countered German intentions. The clash ignited on October 16, 1944, as Soviet forces met the division's southward push head-on. Despite the full force of the Red Army, Nordland managed to steadfastly maintain their positions. A subsequent attempt to break the German forces in Kurland saw the division holding its ground against the odds. On January 23, 1945, a fourth Red Army offensive targeted the clearing of the Kurland pocket, with a focus on Precule. Multiple assaults breached the German defenses, but, in collaboration with the 14th Panzer Division, Nordland launched a successful counterattack to reclaim their positions. By early December of that year, the division's strength had dwindled to 9,000 men. In late January 1945, Nordland Division left the front. They sailed from Lipaya to Szczecin and joined the 11th SS Panzer Army for the defense of Berlin. After refitting in February, the division moved to Reitz for Operation Solstice, surprising Soviet forces and advancing to Arnswall. The town was secured in good success, but strong Soviet counterattacks forced a retreat by late February. As the Soviets launched an offensive on March 1st, Nordland Division fought a desperate, brutal withdrawal, eventually falling back to Altdam by March 7-8. Despite heavy casualties, they held on until March 19th, when the battered division retreated behind the Oder River for a refit west of Schwedbad Freinwalde. Although initially slated for reclassification as a Panzer Division, Nordland remained a Panzer Grenadier Division due to wartime constraints. To bolster its ranks, the division welcomed replacements from the Luftwaffe, Kriegsmarine, Waffen SS, and even a few from the British Free Corps. This included a 300 man battalion from the 33. Waffen Grenadier Division der SS Charlemagne, French SS Volunteers, the Spanish SS Volunteer Company, and additional vehicles. On March 27, 1945, the division, along with the three SS Panzer Corps, relocated to the area north of Angermund. And soon, the division was about to fight on the very streets of Berlin.
On April 16th, Nordland received orders to return to the front line east of Berlin. Despite recent reinforcements, the division still faced significant shortages in personnel, especially among those lacking combat experience, excluding the French and Spanish contingents. The situation was challenging, but an essential boost came in the form of support from 503, Schwerer SS Panzerabteilung, which provided formidable firepower in the defense of the Oder River. Notably, the division was now equipped with 12 Königstieger, Panzer VI OSFB, heavy tanks from the formidable 503. Schwere SS Panzer Abteilung. In the face of the Soviet offensive on April 16, 1945, the 11 SS Freiwilligen Panzer Grenadier Division Nordland was tasked with positioning itself south of Frankfurt on the Oder. However, logistical challenges, including a scarcity of vehicles and fuel, forced the division to adapt its plans, leading it to find its place in the vicinity of Strasbourg, near Berlin. This unexpected shift in location prompted a reassignment to LVI, Panzerkorps, marking a pivotal moment as the division prepared to face the approaching Soviet forces in the critical battle for Berlin. Two days after receiving orders, the division assumed defensive positions to confront the advancing Soviet forces. The wearied troops faced successive retreats, initially through Malsdorf and ultimately back into the heart of Berlin. As the intense battles unfolded, the division's strength dwindled significantly, with a mere 1,500 men remaining by this critical juncture. On April 24th, the focal point of the Soviet assault shifted towards the Treptow Park area, defended by the remaining elements of the Pioneer Battalion and the scant remnants of Panzer Battalion Hermann von Salza. Obersturmbannführer Kausch, leading the few operational tanks and armored vehicles, initiated a courageous counterattack, temporarily halting the enemy's advance, albeit at the cost of some of the division's last remaining vehicles. Despite Kausch's determined efforts, by midday, the relentless Soviet 5th Shock Army managed to resume its push forward. A subsequent counterattack involving three assault guns was met with formidable resistance from a Soviet soldier named Schuljanok, armed with three captured German Panzerfausts. On April 25th, the mantle of leadership in Berlin Defense Sector C passed to Brigade Führer Gustav Krukenberg, a crucial juncture in the command structure. Within this sector lay the Nordland Division, an entity undergoing a seismic shift following the removal of its erstwhile commander, Joachim Ziegler, on the very same day. The Nordland Division found itself grappling with the aftermath of relentless combat, particularly evident in its Norge and Denmark Panzergrenadier regiments. These regiments, once robust, now resembled mere battalions in terms of manpower, having weathered the storms of battle with ferocity and sacrifice. Enter the arrival of battle-hardened French SS men, a timely reinforcement that breathed new life into the beleaguered Nordland division. The Norge and Denmark regiments, their ranks decimated but spirits unbroken, absorbed the fresh infusion of combat-ready soldiers. Together, they formed a formidable front, reinvigorated by the amalgamation of seasoned warriors and steadfast remnants. The realism of the fighting cannot be understated. The scars of conflict were etched on every soldier's face, and the Nordland Division bore witness to the brutal dance of war. Streets, once ordinary, became battlegrounds where survival was measured in every step taken and every shot fired. The Norge and Denmark regiments, reduced to shadows of their former selves, clung to a tenacious determination, a resolve that epitomized the indomitable spirit of those defending Berlin. As Krukenberg assumed command, he faced the arduous task of not just leading troops, but also rebuilding shattered morale and fortifying the lines that had been strained to the breaking point. The landscape of Defense Sector C mirrored the tumultuous nature of the times, with every building bearing witness to the struggle for control and every street corner echoing the distant thunder of artillery. The Nordland Division, with its newly amalgamated forces, stood as a microcosm of the larger conflict. The arrival of French SS men symbolized not only a strategic reinforcement, but also a fusion of diverse experiences, tactics, and tenacities. 
Together, they embarked on the daunting journey of defending Berlin against the relentless tide of war. As of April 26, with Soviet combat groups making significant inroads into Neukölln, a district of Berlin, Brigade Führer Gustav Krukenberg orchestrated a strategic retreat for the defenders of Sector C, focusing their efforts on establishing fallback positions centered around Hermannplatz. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Krukenberg relocated his command post to the Opera House, a move aimed at consolidating leadership amidst the chaos. As the Nordland division withdrew towards Hermannplatz, a formidable alliance of French SS troops and 100 Hitler youth integrated into their ranks, emerged as a resilient force. In a display of coordinated prowess, they unleashed Panzerfausts upon the advancing Soviet armor, resulting in the destruction of 14 Soviet tanks. The streets around Hermannplatz became a theater of urban warfare, with each step backward contested with unwavering determination. One notable episode in this desperate defense unfolded at the Halenzi Bridge, where a tenacious machine gun position, skillfully manned by defenders, succeeded in halting the Soviet advance in that sector for a remarkable 48 hours. The significance of such local victories underscored the fierce resistance put forth by Krukenberg's forces, buying precious time for the broader defensive strategy. Meanwhile, the Nordland Division, equipped with its remaining armor, comprised eight formidable Tiger II tanks from the 503. Schwer SS Panzer Abteilung, along with several assault guns. In a strategic decision, Krukenberg ordered these armored assets to fortify positions in the Tiergarten, a move motivated by the realization that, while the combined divisions under Weidling's LVI Panzer Corps could impede the Soviet advance, a complete halt remained an elusive goal. The Tear Garden, once a tranquil park, now became a battleground of heavy steel and determined soldiers. Krukenberg, recognizing the limited but critical role his remaining armor played, sought to create a formidable obstacle in the path of the advancing Soviet forces. The desperate struggle for control over Berlin's streets and landmarks continued with each decision and maneuver carrying profound consequences in the face of an unstoppable tide of war. By April 27th, the echoes of spirited but ultimately futile defense reverberated through the war-torn streets of Berlin as the remnants of the Nordland Division found themselves forced back into the heart of the central government district within Defense Sector Z. The once bustling urban landscape now bore the scars of intense conflict, with every building and street corner a testament to the tenacity of those who fought to stave off the relentless advance of the Soviet forces. As the defenders of the government district, including the valiant remnants of Nordland, were gradually pushed back. The iconic structures of the Reichstag and Reich Chancellery emerged as the final bastions of resistance. The city, now a maze of rubble and despair, witnessed a desperate struggle for control over these symbolic strongholds, where every room became a battleground and every corridor a potential choke point. In the looming shadow of the Reichstag, the few survivors of the Nordland Division stood undaunted, facing overwhelming odds with a resilience that bordered on the heroic. The air was thick with the acrid scent of war, punctuated by the roar of distant artillery and the staccato rhythm of small arms fire. These courageous souls, clad in the tattered remnants of their uniforms, fought not just for territory but for the very survival of their cause. Amidst the ruins, tales of individual valor and collective sacrifice unfolded. In the Reichstag, a group of Nordland soldiers held a critical intersection against a tide of Soviet infantry, their ammunition running low, but in the Reich Chancellery, a makeshift field hospital operated under flickering lantern light, tending to the wounded amidst the chaos of battle. The relentless onslaught of the Soviet forces left little room for respite. In the chaotic aftermath of Hitler's suicide on April 30th, a tense urgency filled the air as orders reverberated through the crumbling corridors of power. Break out, scatter, survive. As the clock struck 11 hours p.m. on May 1st, 
the Reich Chancellery became a hive of activity, a desperate exodus fueled by a mix of fear and determination. Ten distinct groups, each fueled by a shared desire for escape, embarked on a perilous journey toward the Northwest, aiming for Mecklenburg. The night enveloped them like a cloak, concealing their movements as they navigated through the war-ravaged streets of Berlin. These groups, a mix of individuals ranging from high-ranking officials to Hitler Youth, shared a common thread, the will to evade capture by the Soviets and, if possible, rekindle a semblance of order. The path to Mecklenburg, fraught with danger, demanded resourcefulness, stealth, and a measure of luck that had become a rare commodity in those final days of the war. As they traversed the scarred landscape, they encountered the eerie remnants of a once mighty regime, the skeletal remains of buildings and the hushed whispers of the wind through the desolate streets served as haunting reminders of a world that had crumbled before their eyes. The journey toward Mecklenburg was a test of endurance, both physical and emotional. The ten groups faced challenges that ranged from evading Soviet patrols to navigating through the psychological toll of defeat. Yet against all odds, they pressed on, driven by the instinct to escape the impending collapse and surrender to the American in the West. But the fighting still continued. In the chaotic battleground of Berlin, the Weidendammer Bridge became a symbol of relentless conflict, witnessing fierce engagements, especially where the remnants of the Nordland Division, led by the determined Krukenberg, resisted the advancing forces. The once mighty 503. Schwere SS Panzer Abteilung faced its final moments as its last Tiger tank succumbed to the intense fighting while attempting a daring crossing of the Weidendammer Bridge. Amid the mayhem, scattered and resilient pockets of resistance emerged, with a few determined men managing to reach the safety of the Americans on the west bank of the Elbe. However, hope waned as the majority, including those under Krukenberg's command, found themselves unable to penetrate the tightening Soviet encirclement. In the heart of the battle's maelstrom, Krukenberg, refusing to yield, led his men to Dahlem, where he sought refuge in an apartment. As days passed, the inevitability of surrender loomed large. Krukenberg, once a stalwart commander, endured a week of tense concealment in an apartment but the relentless pressure of war eventually forced him to make the difficult decision to surrender. On the fateful day of May 2nd, the turbulent chapter of hostilities officially drew to a close. The relentless sweep of the Red Army meticulously eradicated lingering pockets of resistance, leaving in its wake a grim aftermath. Around 80,000 German soldiers, now prisoners of war, embarked on an ominous march eastward, their fate hanging in the balance. In the aftermath, a haunting tale unfolded among the ranks of the SS, where loyalty to Hitler's oath drove many to extremes. Some, facing the inevitability of defeat, chose to fight to the bitter end, while others, unable to bear the shame of surrender, opted to take their own lives. For the scant European survivors who managed to reach the safety of the Western Allies' lines, a harsh fate awaited. Stripped of their former allegiances, most were handed over to their respective nations to face the consequences of their actions. The trials that ensued marked a solemn reckoning for those deemed traitors, with sentences ranging from imprisonment to the chilling finality of the death penalty. And that brings our video to a close. Let's take a moment to reflect. The events we explore here aren't just stories. They're chapters in the collective human experience. The of this war is a testament to the strength, sacrifice, and resilience of those who live through it. As we delve into history, let's also remember the lessons it teaches us. War is a harsh reality that leaves scars on nations and individuals. It's crucial not to forget the human cost and the reasons why we should always strive for peace. Share your thoughts in the comments below. What aspects of the European defense of Berlin stood out to you? And remember, history is a conversation. Let's keep it going. Hit that notification bell so you never miss an episode. And until next time, stay curious, stay connected, and never stop exploring the past.